thank you, brother and sister, and church, dad and me. And thank you, church, for the two weeks that you gave Judy and I. And then you came and joined us and uh, spilled some blood, sweat, and tears at our home uh, over on Court Street, and we're just so thankful. Of course, thank you. I want to start a different series, a different direction now uh, in our church. I want to use the man Joshua as one of our, our focuses, only because, uh, I mean certainly because he was a man of God, but because of how God used him and how available he became to God through some pretty difficult circumstances. You know, some of the best things in life come through difficult circumstances, and that was true for, for Joshua. And I pick up uh, Joshua's story. We're going we're gonna to look at this faith journey series with, with Joshua. And today certainly will be on the theme of faith. But, uh, and it, it did take faith when Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the twelve that came back from uh, the promised land with the report. You remember they sent them out as spies, it says, into the land. And so I want us to begin... Uh, with that particular story of Joshua's life. And we're going to follow his life as Moses handed him the mantle of leadership to lead. Not as king, not as president, not as the in power leader, but the prophet, the prophet of God that would lead the nation of Israel. God always wanted a prophet, a man, a woman of God that would lead his people God does not need kings and presidents. He told us that. He told Israel that. And Israel begged for a king and they gave them King Saul. How did that go? That didn't go so well. Then they gave him King David and that went better. But God gave Israel a king because they begged for a king. But God says, you don't want a king. You need a prophet. You need a man who will listen to God. And today, we continue to struggle to listen to God. Joshua was a man that listened to God, a man of faith. So let's begin in Numbers. If you would turn in your Bibles, there's Bibles in your pew if you want to turn there. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Number, number four book, right from the beginning of the Bible. Go to the fourth book over, and that's Numbers in chapter 13. I'm going to be preaching through chapters 13 and 14 this morning. Uh, portions of, uh, at the beginning of chapter 13, you can see a long list where the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, in verse 1. And then it gives the list of, of men that represented one man per tribe. God has a way with numbers. He loves, he loves a tidiness. I, I wouldn't call God OCD, but I would say when you look at the numbers within the Bible, you kind of see this, a God that, that is free-flowing, yes, but organized. God aligns the planets just right, remember? Just so that we don't freeze off or burn up, right? We're on that perfect tilt so that we can uh, possess this land. God knows how to take care of us. And he's ordered these 12 men to go in to the promised land. And so there's, there's the list through verse 15. I want to begin with verse 16 and read through 24, at least get us a portion into this passage. It says, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hosea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. When Moses sent them into, uh, to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and go on to the hill country. See what the Lord is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on, you know, on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe, ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin, as far as uh, Reho, toward Lebo Hanan. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahman, uh, Sheshai, and Telmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before zoned in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them. 
along with some pomegranates and figs. This place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the clusters of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here in your house, believing that you're going to speak to us again, and as we've read your word, we pray your blessing over it. We ask that it would not just be written, but living. May our hearts connect with it and with you. Speak to us today, Lord. We need about 120 uh, messages this morning, one for each of us. And each message is unique. I'll speak, Lord, but we pray that we would hear your words. In Jesus' name, amen. The time of 40 years is nearly completed. God has announced where the promised land is, and he's giving this promised land to the Israelites. The former generations, they're pulling back. After 40 years in the wilderness, since the time that they left Egypt, they want to stay. They have found things that they like. There's parts of the land that just seem okay to them. Uh, the generations of Israelites uh, so often struggled with moving on to something new. Does that remind uh, any of you of the people of today? Sometimes we just have a hard time uh, moving on to something new. They wanted to stay. They may not have had it great, and they even daydream of their slavery days in Egypt. At least we had, and they would make their list. They wanted to go back. God wanted them to go forward. The new generations, the generations born in the desert, they were the ones that wanted to go. And so in the end, Joshua and Caleb would take the people of Israel into the promised land. The generations that came out, came out of Egypt, they stayed. The generations born in, Egypt, born in, uh, in the desert, they went into the promised land. What an unusual line of events we're following through. But here is Joshua and the other twelve being called to go in to this land. But they're about to experience change. Now I've heard it said, the only, the only person that likes change is a wet baby. <laughs> and that, there's truth to that. There's truth to that. Some of the most exciting tales of our, of our lives come from, though, the, the very greatest boys where we don't know what to do, or changes in our lives that were even put upon us, like the death of a loved one, or, or whatever might be going on in our lives at that time. Take one of your most exciting moments in life, just think about it for a moment, and then evaluate it. What did that most exciting moment in your life, what did it come out of? Many times, comes out of some of the most difficult moments. My mother was due to, a, to attend Spring Arbor College, now Spring Arbor University. She had signed up for her classes. She was ready to go until she got a call from someone in the Midwest. Because she lived in Wisconsin, she needed to attend Washington Springs College in South Dakota because she lived in that district. Many people have shaken their heads ever since. I don't remember them ever doing that and making people go to certain colleges because of where they live, necessarily, but my mom got a call. And so Grandma and Grandpa Bush and sent their daughter over to Westington Springs. And that's where she met my dad. And I would, be, would not be here today if it wasn't for Westington Springs. And there was an arbor where, in Westington Springs where they got engaged and it's all really lovely, that stuff. <laughs> Great vines are across it. There's actually an arbor that was given to my mom and dad for one of their anniversaries, and mom couldn't keep it. It's in the backyard of our house where we just moved. Just received it uh, recently. Where we said, Mom, we'll, we'll keep it for you. Certain things you got to keep for mom, huh? <laughs> the things that come out, the, the blessings that come out of Maybe changes in our lives that we don't always get to choose. So God ordains these 12 representatives from 12 tribes to go check out the promised land. Let's talk about the sending 
right there in the first verse of chapter 13, it's descending because uh, God is about to birth, uh, God has already birthed these 12 tribes under Jacob, and he has, he has called these, these 12 tribes to, to be together, and, and they name them, don't they? It was, his, it was Jacob's 12 sons that would establish Israel as a nation. It was time to explore this land now that God promised them. And, there's, and, and yet there's no indication that these men were supposed to uh, report back for the purpose of evaluation. Evaluation was not the word that God used. It wasn't the word that Moses used. It was simply to report back what they were going to experience. It was not information given to them so that they could make the best decision about whether they should go or not. It's kind of like announcing to the church, we're going to buy a new church in Kimball Township. And uh, everybody says, okay, well, it looks like we've already bought it, so let's vote on whether it's the right thing to do or not. It's kind of that backwards thinking, you know what I mean? You've made the decision, you bought the car, and now you kind of want to vote on whether you should buy the car. It just doesn't make sense, does it? And yet that's what was going on here. God wanted to entice the people, to encourage them, to help them see how God wanted to bless them. How come we feel at times that we need to question people's passion, people's dreams, their plans in their lives. You see, this was a good plan. God has a good plan in place, and He's simply sending these men in to check it out. You ever had a good plan in your own life, and you were all excited about it, and you shared it with someone, and they just started to, to pour on the criticism and say, well, what about this, what about that, and I don't think you should do it. And you walk away from that person, and you unfriend them. But you struggle. You struggle, don't you? With You thought you had a good idea. It doesn't mean you can't uh, sharpen, on, uh, sharpen iron on iron. But, but again, we need to encourage each other. Go for it. Go for it. That brings me to the name. It's interesting how Joshua got his name. In verse 16... Remember that Joshua was not only one of the spies that went in to check out the land, but he was also with Moses when Moses climbed Mount Sinai. And, and he, he knew that, that he could only go so far because Moses told him, he says, now you wait right here, I'm going to go on ahead, but you stay here. And Joshua was that support for Moses uh, and others with him. His name was... Hosea. His name is Hosea. His name means deliverance. What's well, a good name? That's a good, thanks, mom and dad. What were the parents thinking way back when, when little Hosea was born as a, as a baby, and there he was, seven or eight pounds of him, and, and the parents held him and says, "Your name shall be Hosea. You are to be a deliverer." It's quite a title. Hosea would grow up and say, Mom and Dad, how am I going to fulfill that, son? Well, the Lord knows. And in fact, when he was named Hosea, and he was renamed by Moses, in fact, the name Joshua, coming out of Hosea, means the Lord is deliverance. So he kept the name Hosea, but it was Joshua, but it wasn't, it wasn't Joshua as deliverer, but it was the Lord the Lord is deliverance. Joshua, I can only imagine as a, as a young man, you know, sometimes we, we have the man coming of, uh, the boy coming of age, and at 16, uh, I don't know how old Joshua was at this time, but, uh, but he's going, you are to be the Lord is deliverance. What a mantle Joshua had on him. Certainly Moses wanted Joshua to know that he would only succeed if he trusted God and his power and not his own. And the names of those going are listed in our text, but he's the only one that's renamed. There's significance to that. 
So 12 men go and bring back a report that brings us to the exploring in verse 21 and following. It says that they went for 40 days. Interesting that it took that long to travel in various portions of the land. I, I, I kind of think of an afternoon. <laughs> we'll be back at 5, you know. But in fact, they traveled a long journey and they took 40 days. Again, a significant number for us. And they used the word spies uh, to describe them, at least in the English language. But in the Hebrew text, spies is not the, the best word necessarily, uh, even though they had to sneak from place to place. What did God want them to find? What did the, what did the early explorers look for when they went to the Northwest? I think of the, a number of, of, of the explorations. You know, we sent men out on these explorations. What exactly were they looking for? They didn't really know, did they? They didn't know what they would find. Uh, they, they, they found certain portions of the western United States, and they thought, well, we found the wall, the mountains. <laughs> well, we found the wall. We should turn back. We can tell them we found the wall. But they kept going, didn't they? And they found high elevations of snow even in the summertime. And, and they didn't know what they were going to find. These explorers, these spies, did not know what they were going to find. I think sometimes in life, we want to know what we're going to find. God, I know you want me to do this, but tell me why you want me to do it. God, I know you want me to do this, but tell me what's going to happen. God, I, I believe that you're in this, but you've got to give me something more. We say that, don't we? We want more. Well, there's, there's characters in the Bible that, that wanted more. Moses wanted more. So God said, Moses, throw down your staff. <laughs> this may not end well. <laughs> and the staff becomes a snake. Uh, but I got it covered, Moses. No problem. Your staff has become a snake. But don't worry, I got this taken care of. Take, pick up the snake by a tail. You never pick up a snake by the tail. <laughs> and it became a staff. Be careful what you ask God. So they went to explore. They went to find whatever it was they were to find. They found the negative, a parched, barren land. They moved to the place where the large people lived, the annex. They found the Valley of Eshkol. We read that a moment ago, where the clusters of grapes could only be uh, hauled by two men on a pole. Pomegranates and figs, too. I could only imagine what was left off the list. As I read this passage, maybe like you would, I'm thinking, 40 days, and that's the list? I'm thinking so much more. And there was. But they don't list it here. Where did they go? What, what towns did they come near? And yes, they mentioned different places, but I, you can't tell me they only visited those places in 40 days, but, but it's there. So much that they saw in the abundance of the land. So they came back to report in verse 26. They come back after 40 days and they reported on what they found. <laughs> Remember that it was a, to be a report of good news and, and the things that they would look forward to. And some of it, yes, they begin with some of the good news. And so they began to share everything that they had found. For us as a family, one of our one of our pastimes was looking forward to vacations. My, of course, I looked forward to a vacation. This last vacation was a little different vacation to look forward to, right? Just kind of a different vacation. But, but let me take you to some other vacations where maybe you actually get to go somewhere. Um, it's, it's half the fun to prepare for the vacation, isn't it? You know, I have uh, some friends over in the Flint area. A bunch of them are getting ready to go to Hawaii. Anybody been to Hawaii? I have. <laughs> we all go to different places, don't we? And uh, we, some of you have been outside the country. How many of you have been outside the country? Wow, quite a few. How many of you have been outside the state of Michigan? Okay, how many of you would rather stay home? Is there, is there a few? See, that's great, that's great. We're all different, aren't we? And 
my wife has told me before, the greatest vacation I can have is me staying home, y'all go away. Yeah. And I love that, you know, it's kind of like, so I go golfing or, or, or bike riding. You know. But we look forward to these vacations, that's half the fun. We get to do things that we want to do, we get to eat different places that we would never get to eat any other time. And so this report is similar. They come back not necessarily from a vacation, although you got to admit, 40 days, these guys were into this, right? You're, you're, you're sending these 12 guys, they've got their camping gear, and they're hiking across the land, and this is an adventure. And they get to go, and they come back with this report. The, the land is flowing with milk and honey. This is significant. For these terms mean peace and plenty. Peace and plenty. Milk and honey. But then comes, but then comes that dreaded word, that word that we all know is coming with this story. The big B-U-T, the but. But guess what else we found? And they begin to report the downside of the land. They looked like giants in one portion. And there are so many hurdles, and they have these high walls around the cities, and, and there's, and they come to this stopping point. They hit the western wall in the mountains of Colorado, so to speak. You see, it's a stopping point for us today. You see, when God calls us to do something with our life, He's not interested in us developing our questionable spirit. But we have one, don't we? We have this questionable spirit. A spirit that has all of these questions of, of challenge. And, and we, we kind of, God says, I want you to do something for me. And we kind of go like this. We kind of go, okay, tell me where you want me to go. We've already got our hand on the rope and pulling back on God, see. We're pulling back on God uh, right from the beginning before we even hear from the Lord. It's that questioning spirit. Now we know that only two of these men came back with a favorable report. And ten who poo-pooed the whole mission. They were just like, let's stay home. I've got my garden. It's not much of a garden, but i got a garden. As long as that pillar of cloud doesn't move again. You might remember the, the song, 12 men went to spy in pain, and 10 were bad, and 2 were good. Remember that? Some of you? How many of you don't know that song? <laughs> you have lived a sad life. <laughs> some tell giants tough and tall, some saw grapes in clusters fall. Oh. Oh, <laughs> so I'm God, but I said, you know, ten do we get? Okay, no, no. So, so who were the two good? Joshua and? Caleb. Caleb, right. I, I say, and I would say Caleb and Joshua, because in this text, I found it interesting that Caleb spoke up first. In fact, Joshua doesn't speak hardly at all until he's included in, uh, in the Caleb and Joshua kind of comments towards, towards the end of this story. We read in verse 30, Then Caleb silenced the people. All of this negative negativity was going on. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, or we certainly could do it. And this brings us to the question of the day. And I give you this question. Is it even our task to evaluate what God has told us to do, or is it simply our task to go and do what God called us to do? Amen. Why are we talking about this? It's as if we're tempted to answer questions that have not been asked. God did not ask that Canaan be put up to a vote. The quest was not for the 12 representatives to come back as judge and jury. So I have a thought. Is it possible that Caleb spoke up first before Joshua because Joshua knew that there was no reason to speak at all? The decision was made. This wasn't a decision to be made. The decision was already made. So Joshua knew 
what this was about. He didn't have to convince anybody because he knew that God was going. And he knew that he was going. And if y'all want to follow, fine. Get the feeling that Joshua was a type A personality. Get him adrift. He was going to go. So he didn't need to speak up. It doesn't mean that Caleb was wrong for speaking up. And yeah, there's a little interpretation on my part of this. But, but I had to think that through. Why didn't Joshua speak up? He's the leader. He's the up-and-coming rising star of, of Israel. You see, when God tells us to do something, do it. Let's do it. When God says, do it, just do it, is a theme some of us would like to, to herald these days. If God gives you an awesome idea, don't come to the pastor and say, Pastor, this is what you should do. Pastors could write a book on things that people think the pastor should do. <laughs> Every one of us could write a book. Chapter 143. Oh, I love you. I love you a lot. But if God tells you to do something, do it. You do it. People come to me, especially newer people come to the church, and they'll say, Pastor, I really feel that God's gifted me for leaders. So I'd like to step up in leadership. I said, awesome. I want you to step up in leadership. Do me a favor and take this brush. Now I want you to go clean the toilet. I don't always use that illustration, okay? I'm a little nicer than that. But, but when people, I tell people, I want you to become a part of whatever ministry you feel led to become a part of. And when you begin to serve there, people will gravitate to you. Do you know why? Because you've already told me you're a leader. They will come alongside you, and they'll start doing, and people will start following you. And let me tell you, a pastor cannot keep any person from being a leader in the church. If you just start doing stuff, and people start following you, you're a leader. People who call themselves a leader, but nobody's following them, <laughs> they're on a walk. <laughs> they're just taking a walk, you know? pastor doesn't have to be in charge of the church. I might be a point person in one form or another. But we are the people of God, and when God tells us to do something, we just go and do it. We go and do it. Well, I'm kind of going to bring this to a close now. There's two more things to talk about. You can see if you know it's catch it. So let's get to it. These last two thoughts. If we're going to do what God tells us to do, Whatever it is he's told us to do, then there's two steps that we have to realize we're going to have to go through. And they're both found in verse 10 of our text. I'm sorry, in verse 10 of chapter 14. Moving all the way into chapter 14, we've moved a long way through this story, and here we come to one verse. <laughs> I call it the stoning. Okay? The stoning of all things. We all have to go through the stoning, or the potential stoning. Look at verse 10 in the first part of verse 10a. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Them. Caleb and Joshua, maybe others who followed in, in line. Certainly, I can't imagine them stoning Moses. But look back to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14. It begins back there. That night, the people of the community raised their voices and they wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If we had only died in Egypt, or this desert, now there's a vision. Now there's a vision. That, you know, what are, if only... Do you see what they're saying there? If only we had died in Egypt. Are you so low to the ground that you would want something that would just make no difference? Prisoners in a former land? That's really what you want. But that, in fact, is exactly what they said. This was serious business. It, it has often been said, if you're going to do something right, someone's going to come against you. And that's your stone. Someone's gonna gonna say, you gotta be crazy to do that. If you hear someone say, you gotta be crazy to do that, then it's probably the will of God. 
Because if you attempt to do something that you can do under your own will, then most of the time it's not of God. God wants to do things that reveal His glory. He wants us to be the people of God to do things that this world says it's impossible to do. So how about we attempt something like that? Last Monday when I gave Eileen the call, I guess it was before Monday, Eileen. Where are you? There you are. When I gave you the call on Friday or Saturday in preparation for Alvin's funeral, and then, I'm sorry, for Trisha's funeral first, and then Alvin's funeral on Wednesday. And I kept looking at Eileen, are you going to be okay? Are you going to be okay? You know, and uh, we handled both of those, and, and now another this week. It seemed impossible. It always seems impossible at first, doesn't it, Eileen? Mm -hmm. But you are the people of God, and you come together, and we, we blessed two families. And man, Adina, where are you? There you are. And... You, you had friends and family produce dishes for uh, your daughter's you know, memorial service. And man, they just came out of the woodwork and I'm so thankful for that. You know, sometimes when things seem impossible, even going through a time of, of mourning and loss, friends, when God calls us to do something, whether we choose it or don't have a choice, we don't think we have a choice, we just do it, don't we? And we follow God. But there's, but there's something we have to go through, and it's our conflict. It's the conflict of people coming against us. You see, sometimes the conflict of crisis is the very launching point for what God wants to do. It's the point of conflict that's the launching pad. It's when someone comes against you and you stand strong and you say, I, I love you, but I really feel like I'm supposed to do this. You don't have to be mean about it, but you just stay positive. Caleb and Joshua, they just kept saying, we're going. You don't get that, do you? We're going. And so they considered a literal <coughs> stoning. But that brings us to the second part of this verse. And it reveals... <laughs> The appearing. Notice that right in the middle of this crisis, when they're considering stoning two men of God, it says in verse 10b, then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord came down. Now how is the glory of the Lord coming down uh, at, at night? By fire, right? And by cloud by day. And so when God was, was with Moses at the tent of meeting, a cloud would come down and the Israelites would wait. Until God uh, spoke to Moses, and Moses would come out, and he would say, Thus saith the Lord, right? And, and so, here, in the middle of this conflict, in the middle of this stoning, all of a sudden, it says, The glory of the Lord came down at the tent of meeting. In the middle of the conflict, God shows up, and he says, Caleb and Joshua, I'm right here with you. Moses, you're not alone. I'm going to take care of this. <laughs> wow. The good news is, it's only a stone. <laughs> the good news is, it's only a stoning. Paul went through it and lived, and so can we. There's a stoning in our land. There's a stoning in our world today, and it's going on and it's getting stronger. Can you hear the rumble? Can you hear the rumble in the Western world? There's a stoning. We don't even know which bathrooms to go to these days. I couldn't be more serious. We don't know where to go for what. We call this that and that this. We call up, down, and down, up. The guy that says, I've got a word. I've got a word, and you can find it in the tent of meeting. And if you'll listen, if in the middle of your stoning, if you'll listen, I'll come down and I'll speak to you, and I'll give you a word. That will never, never end. You see, later God called Joshua and Caleb to enter the promised land. Joshua was later anointed prophet to lead the people. They were the only two of the twelve that were allowed to enter. The other ten were left behind. And do you know why they were left behind? Because they wanted to be left behind. Interesting. They wanted 
to be left behind. They requested it. God has been leaving us behind for decades because we want to be left behind. The American church is being left behind because it doesn't want to leave its former ways. Its ways of comfort. We would rather go back to Egypt in our ways. We would rather even die in our deserts of, of boredom than take the risk of stepping out and potentially failing. But God is calling us this morning to do something. I want to be a Caleb. I want to be a Joshua. Do you? Do you want to be one that enters the promised land or do you want to just love, love your loved ones and bury them in the desert? Let me tell you one way in closing and I, I asked Diana if I could share this story. Right in the middle of Trisha's memorial service, we were talking about Trisha's wonderful life and all of the good things that we could say about her. And I was telling a story about a little girl at Detroit Children's Hospital that Trish had been caring for. She was a concierge for a while at uh, Detroit Children's Hospital. And this little girl uh, was going to have chemo, and she was talking with Trish, and she said, Miss Trish, whatever she called her, she said, I, I'm going to lose my hair, and I'm just so afraid that my friends are going to laugh at me. And I don't know what to do. And Trish said, Ruthie, and it was Ruth, she said, what if you had another friend who was just like you and didn't have any hair? She goes, well, what do you mean? She says, Ruthie, why don't you cut my hair? And she gave her a pair of scissors and she let her cut her hair. And then because she, she knew how to love this little girl, she knew to just do it. She knew to step out of her old life into a new life of connecting with someone in need. She shaved her head. And she lived that way for a short time, I'm sure, uh, for little Ruthie. And as I'm telling them the story right here, I had 